I'm Walter Block. I'm Jody Emery. This is Adam Kokesh. I'm Jeffrey Tucker. I'm Ben Swan. I'm Tom Woods. I'm Peter Schiff. I'm Eric Voorhees. And you're listening to... And you're listening... And you're listening... You're listening... You're listening to... Ed and Ethan. Soak up the awesomeness. Listening to Ed and Ethan, the voice of liberty in Canada, coming to you from Saskatoon, the province of Saskatchewan, in the wide wastes of Canada. My intrepid co host today, of course, is the incredible Andrew Bassett coming in to fill in, fill in again for Ed. So, Andrew, welcome to the program. Well, it's so much fun to be back here again. Don't sound so excited. <laughs> I was like, you know what? It's kind of funny. Uh, somebody actually once said that you, you're, you're kind of, in contrast, you kind of have this like deadpan delivery. That, that, that is very different from my own, so it creates this interesting sort of skew to the program that doesn't exist normally. Yeah, we're like uh, oil and vinegar. <laughs> I like to think we get along better than that. Um, of, of course, you're, I am your host, Ethan. You're listening to us on Daily Paul Radio at dailypaulradio.com, as well as LRN, Liberty Express, VVN, and all sorts of other fantastic places on the web you want to check out. Our stuff, you can go to edneathan.com for the latest updates. You'll find our Twitter tubes, Facebook stuff, all that junk there. So, you know, visit. And I'm sure I'll probably write something again at some point when I get some time. It'll happen. Um... Lots to talk about today. We are going to talk to Bruce Fenton. He is a serial investor, an entrepreneur, somebody who spends a lot of time in the Middle East, uh, works with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, that kind of thing, and majorly into Bitcoin. Bruce Fenton is a fantastic and wonderful person to talk to, so you're going to enjoy that in the second half. Uh, we'll go into an after show with him as well. It's going to be fun, right? I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you know, I don't know. It's a quality guest. You'd, you'd think it's going to be fun. But for now, let's get into our own heads and talk about the nonsense of the world that exists, the craziness that comes up, especially out of central Saanich, I guess, in the province of British Columbia. This is funny because hey, we've talked here on the show about things like voluntary prisons. Robert Murphy has a neat talk you can find on YouTube about... Uh, you know, where would the criminals in society go, right? Uh, there is not a complete equivalency here, but this is an interesting story that I think has some parallels to that idea. So uh, the story reads here from timescolonist.com, the district of Central Saanich is going to court in an effort to shut down operations at Woodwind Farms, and it's creating homefulness society. Uh, in a notice of civil claim filed in B.C. Supreme Court, Central Saanich asked that Woodwind Farms be ordered to stop using the 200-acre property on the West Saanich Road for commercial office and institutional use and as a recreational vehicle and mobile home park and campground. Central Saanich also wants the court to declare that a store and coffee shop is not a farmer's market under agricultural land reserve regulations and that the use of the barn as a store and coffee shop violates BC's building code and the district building bylaw. Hmm. Yeah. So the impression I get here is, uh, well, they say right there, it's not a farmer's market. Because <laughs> we, it doesn't, of course, it, 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 doesn't, uh, it doesn't hold up to the rules, the standards we've yeah, set. Yeah, we, we have a certain idea of how a farm should be. It's not <laughs> matching up with that. Right. And uh, therefore it needs to go away. But, I mean, there's all kinds of innovation uh, going on here in this on this, this it is, farm because what we haven't mentioned yet is that this farm is a place for uh, homeless people down on their luck to come mm -hmm. and be productive, right? So they they can get a job, they can they have a place to stay. Uh, it's a very peaceful kind of this oh, yeah. two hundred acre property. It's a great place to be. Oh, it, it, it sounds like a great idea. Well, this is okay. So the reason that I find this interesting and draw the equivalent to Robert Murphy's thing is is because this is a project in which people who have a limited value expression towards society, right? So when I was a homeless kid, I would say my value expression to society was limited at the time, and I was seeking ways to improve myself so that people would find more value within me, right? Yeah. That's that was my goal. And these people are in the same sort of situation. I can empathize deeply with this. And it is a great advantage to have a place to go where somebody says, look, check it out. Work with us. We'll give you a place to stay. It's a very nice place. It's very peaceful. Yeah. You can you can make some of the products that we sell for a profit. It's all voluntary. We're not forcing you to be here. Right. That's pretty neat. It gives these so, people a, a chance yeah. to get a leg up, right? So, so well, we, it's like we don't care if you have a criminal record or, mm -hmm. you know, like if you have certain 
problems in your past. We'll overlook it. I don't know. I was wondering, do they pay minimum wage? You know what? I bet they would have to. Uh, yeah, <laughs> they would have to. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. but but it's really cool because it's all voluntary association. You, This is an example yeah. of how you can approach people who may even have had, who knows, a violent past, right? And say, yeah. look, just don't be violent here. We're going to overlook it. We're going to give you a chance because there's a mutual benefit here, right? right. It's not just that these people are being, uh, I want to use the word altruistic, although I have problems with the very concept of altruism, but um, it's not just that these people are trying to be kind. That is an element here, but also they have found a way to make this sustainable so that they make a profit so that they can they can keep this going. Right. And I think in all forms of in all aspects of life, there are mutual benefits to be found. I mean, if they can make mm-hmm. money while helping uh, these homeless people make money, well, that's sort of how uh, economies get built. That you're absolutely right. That is how economies get built. It's people finding those points of those origins of mutual value. But of course, here the government doesn't see it that way, right? Yeah. The government says, "Well, no, this is agricultural land. You're not using it properly. We've zoned it for a certain. Right. You know, r- twist monocle, smoke cigar. <laughs> ah, you all wrong. It's it's nuts because here it is an organization that's actually providing value that's really helping people, and it's just because they're not doing it the right way." that government will get involved. But well, there, was, there was some mention here also of the NIMBY problem, right? Not in my backyard. Yeah. Um, people having this real problem with bringing homeless people into the community, right? I think that's, you know, I'll, 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 I'm okay, well, playing to my own bias. We're but talking about a pretty real. rural area here, right? So mm-hmm. there's only so far you can get away from someone's backyard. <laughs> that's true. Right? I'm, but yeah, there will always be people who have maybe an issue with how you're using your property, right? Yeah. So how do you circumvent the rights of an individual to use the property as they wish? Well, the answer is to go to government and have your yeah. will imposed upon them, right? Well, <laughs> and I mean, it kind of goes against the idea of a, a property when you can tell your neighbor not to uh, have a bum living in the basement. right. No, they, you're absolutely correct, but it also goes against the, the just the very notion of what makes uh, what justifies government, right? It's supposed to be this this organization that helps people out, that 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 protects the downtrodden, right? That that's yeah. one of the the stated goals. And here it, you can see where people use the established power structure n- rather than to protect those people that need protection, rather than to help those people that need help with a leg up as this private concern is doing on their own, right? Rather than that, no, the government is coming in to use in a very weaselly sort of fashion the rules that exist, the rules that they've created to, Im- to impose somebody else's preference. Well... The government can't control the the way that they're helping people, so it can't be that good of a thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I mean, we can't we, control we, that. It must be anarchic we, chaos. We, yeah, we need it. <laughs> I mean, if maybe if this was a social program where they they mm. built a, a barn and a farm and they had people, <laughs> that that would be that would be very altruistic. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it's 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 terrible. I, I yeah. you know, my heart goes out to those people who are running this sort of a program, because um, it's just my gosh, it's this great example of something effective, of something that helps people, and just because some others don't prefer it, well, that's uh, that's that's justification to go and kill and quash it, because yeah, it just yeah. <laughs> not okay. Um, <laughs> There, when it comes to government control, of course, over the lives of the individual and, and how they administer their property, I, I often think of prostitution. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I, 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 think it's a, I think it's an interesting issue that comes up, right? Uh, well, there's a comedian out there that has this line about, isn't the ultimate test of ownership whether or not you can sell something? <laughs> He's talking about prostitution. Um, there's so what's happened in Canada recently is uh, a court has struck down those laws that ban the solicitation of prostitution uh, as being unconstitutional, right? They violate the Charter of uh, Rights and Freedoms. Yeah, so basically, prostitution has been legal in Canada for the past few months, I think. Well, there's it, it hasn't been because there's a grace period, right? There's a grace, they basically, the court says the government yeah, can continue violating rights for another year, technically, but. <laughs> Uh, for all purposes, no one's going to prosecute anyone now. I don't know about that. 
I mean, it depends, right? I, I think that if a prosecutor thinks that they could get a case through the court system technically, then they, they might pursue mm -hmm. it. it. It really depends on a given situation. But um, when, when it comes to the government's reaction... The government's reaction has not been, oh, that's a violation of rights, and yeah. the courts have decided... Oh, we screwed that, up with our laws. Oh. We, we should do something... Yeah, we, we, should, we should probably make this more free. Yeah. No, what they've oh. done is they said, well, maybe what we can do technically to, to continue <laughs> a ban of prostitution is, is rather than penalize uh, prostitutes, those who sell sex, maybe we should focus more on penalizing those who buy sex, right? So the, so the Johns, yeah. right? um, which I, that flabbergasts me. Right. I mean, I mean, well, that's what they do with drugs, and and it really helps there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good thing that there's no pot or cocaine in Canada. Yeah, yeah it doesn't. It's just nothing. None of that. Right. Right. Hmm? Well, I mean, <laughs> is it, now are we going to have uh, how, how much more uh, resources is it going to take to, you know, weed out the the buyers of? Mm. It seems to me that that has always been more difficult for law enforcement is going after the demand side, right? Than going after the supply well, and that's side. that's what they want to do though is they want to discourage demand, right? They they want to kill the market for demand, and just like you point out, that doesn't seem to work so good, does it? Hmm. You know, you you already well, how, have these how do markets. you discourage demand? You do that with uh, stiffer prison panel prison sentences, mm. and build all more, the, for to do that, you got to build more prisons, mm -hmm. right? I mean, all, all that does is create an incentive for increased cost because now you're creating a system that's more dangerous, yeah. but it doesn't actually get rid of what people want, which is drugs or sex or yeah. whatever. So uh, I I don't know. It, it, it's I don't expect anything of government, so it's not really like this surprises me or catches me off guard. I mean, yeah, okay, so they're going to earmark some tens of millions of dollars to go after John's now and... I don't know. Look, the the answer to this is really pretty simple, right? If you have somebody who wants to buy sex and you have somebody who wants to sell sex and they engage in a voluntary exchange, then what's wrong? No. I gotta, nobody's been hurt by that, right? No, I think that part is pretty simple. And I just I think it's kind of disturbing that we're we're going from a, a sort of a system where we were we were punishing the suppliers of sex. Uh, mm. Now we're going to focus more on the on the demand side, and I think, I think that's going to be even worse than what we had before. It's getting worse. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. no, no, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. It, it it is worse. It's more violent. It's it's really. I don't know. This this is the legal system that is victimizing people actively. It, it, it's it's yeah. not it's not even a case where these people are, um, just, you know, well. I, I don't know, like, I, I can't logic this in my brain because it doesn't make any sense that we would just so readily victimize people for making the wrong choice. It's just like the last story, right, about, about Woodwind Farms. It's people saying, I prefer not to buy sex, so I don't think anybody else should buy sex. And I don't care if your judgment is, is great for you or terrible for you. It's kind of for you to figure that out, right? Yeah. But you, this, this notion that you can make this judgment for everybody else, it, it flabbergasts me. It's crazy. There's, where does that right come from? Yeah. You know, I think we're a pretty liberal country Preference. when it comes to you know, respecting you know, personal rights and, and yeah. consenting adults can do what they want. But I think when you throw economics and and free trade into mm. the mix that's when people get all upside down on that well because they don't really understand these right. concepts right there, there's such a widespread economic illiteracy yeah is people just don't get these concepts and and they prefer to defer to emotion i feel that the world should be a certain way i feel like the world needs to do what i think it should do and that's a justification right that's a, it's yeah. it's consequentialist thinking Right, as I always talk about consequentialism and deontological thinking, and consequentialist thinking is basically appealing to what I want the world to be. I want the world to act a certain way, so that's how it should act. Um, I think uh, there, there's there's another uh, sort. Of, we move from from sexual, you know, the laws banning sex to yeah. this case in Saskatoon, uh, right here in our our little neck of the woods, uh, of sexual assault, or I guess. What is it? Uh, Har human harassment. Rights. Oh, it was a case of what was it? Harassment. 
Yeah. So there's a hotel here in Saskatoon called Northwoods Inn and Suites. Um, very classy. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a dive. Um, but anyway, the uh, the owner of the of the hotel, I guess he's he's been fined uh, nearly forty five thousand uh, dollars. It was for sexual harassment, right? right? So. An employee that worked there, she uh, had to deal with his sexual advances, complimenting her looks and in a fairly crude way. Yeah. Um, I guess there's also talk of how she oh, he hugged and kissed her on one occasion. Uh, she said no, but he ignored her, which would imply it doesn't actually that specifically he continued state, doing but it. Yeah, it would imply that he continued when she said no, right? Right. That's I think I, I think if that's the case, that's that's assault, right? Yeah. Like that makes I would sense think so. to me. But this whole, um, you know, the fine of forty five thousand dollars, the the human rights case where you know she was sexually harassed, yeah, that doesn't quite wash with me. Well, what I found was interesting was of that forty five thousand dollars that and I guess the judge, I guess she sued him, or and then the judge awarded in her favor forty five thousand yeah. dollars. Ten thousand dollars of that was punitive mm-hmm. uh, for the actual uh, harassment. Right, and then the other thirty-five thousand or so uh, was for her lost earnings. Right, and actually, there was an also there was also three thousand dollars in there for um, the the guy. He, I guess he was belligerent in court, so, <laughs> so, so they tacked him yeah. on for that. Um, but no, yeah. So so some of it was to replace income, and some of it was for punitive damages. Like you mentioned, ten thousand dollars for punitive damages, and this is why this I have a lot of trouble with this. What like what was that's not restorative, right? That's just a punishment. We're going to say we're going to attach a certain amount of value to a punishment. But what did it restore? So if this woman, and I I grant, by the way, let's not make it sound like I think that it's okay to create a hostile no, he work does, environment. He doesn't sound like a very nice guy, at least no. I mean, the certain, way the story's written. Well, yeah. I'm not sure. Who, who knows? I don't know the guy personally, but certainly, like you say, the way the story's written, it, there's a strong implication here that this guy's kind of a jerk. Yeah. Right? So, so I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm not saying, hey, look, everybody go apply for a job at Northwoods Inn and Suites because that sounds like the place to be. <laughs> I anything but that. But what I am trying to figure out here is what does the ten thousand dollars replace? What was what was made whole here? Because the thirty some odd thousand dollars that she got for lost income was for the job that she lost because she went back to drug use because of stress. And we can talk about that. I don't even think that's quite right. But well, I guess what's implied here, and I, I know you like to focus on the 10000 but I'm a little more put off by the, the uh, 35000 for okay. lost earnings. And uh, I guess what's implied here is because she was harassed, she had no reasonable alternative but to quit her job. Uh, stood at home, I assume, without a job for, I don't know how long that would have been for her, a year? Yeah, I think it was a year or two. Year? Yeah. Uh, and that if he hadn't harassed her, she could have continued working there. Um, I don't know. I guess it, it kind of says to me that we're saying that she had a human right to have a job and continue oh, working there. Right. But is that really the case? Well, because she basically what she's running up against is that she has a job that she wants, she, an income that she wants to continue collecting, right? Yeah. And... She doesn't want to be sexually harassed. She feels it's too much to put up with. So then she basically loses her job to to her preferred addiction. And now she's lost that income. She's lost opportunity. Her life has been terribly disrupted. She places the blame for that on her employer. Yeah, and, and I'm not going to... Uh, of course, it's a, it's a huge disruption to... Uh, to work at a job where suddenly your working conditions are absolutely intolerable. So you have to quit. And then you had to figure out what else you're going to do. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'm not going to, you know, downplay how disruptive that can be. Sure. But I mean, they they talk about this as being a human rights uh, story. Right. And what and you're getting are at they to... saying is it a human right to have a job? And I know a lot of people think so. We mm. we you know. Yeah, because um, I mean, my solution to this is basically to disassociate with, you know, like, okay, look, I am trying to balance the value of my income against the value of dealing with this guy who's really yeah. huggy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I would have preferred to see the entire amount be punitive and not, you know, restorative. Yeah. yeah I, 
I don't, but I don't even know that there's any logical case to be made for a punitive damage. I, even in the case that she was assaulted, can can you? I, I what was what was tangibly taken from her? Because at this point, I, look, if it gets that bad, I think that at this point you need to start seeking other opportunities. Like it's just a risk value judgment in your in your brain, right? Do I do, do I continue to bear with the uh, income? and deal with Mr. Touchy Feely or do I leave and and certainly there's there's a case to be made for uh, like I said that he, he he certainly I think maybe violated her rights again it's implied um when he hugged her and kissed her and wouldn't stop but in that case again what was taken tangibly from her I think at that point you you get a hit on your social credit rating in a voluntary society right this this guy doesn't respect people's rights and space yeah but what was taken that's my my question i don't think there is an answer for that i think that she was made uncomfortable and she probably should have left and sought out a better opportunity that's kind of how in a free market you have a a a propensity for finding greater value a better workplace a less hostile work environment maybe it's partly cultural like we we tend to live in a society where you you have a job and maybe you spend 20 30 years working there mm-hmm. i know other parts of the world don't really have that type of culture no you yeah, you're absolutely right there well this is another dysfunction in, in contemporary society i think is i i think that employment typically is encouraged to be much more kind of set in stone yeah. than i think it should be i yeah, think i think true. it should be a lot more normal for people to just move from job to job if they want i i yeah. think um there are a couple minutes left, and I want to touch on this really quickly. It's kind of a kicker story. It's been going around a lot, and it does relate also to sex and conduct. And it's this, okay, so there's a teenage boy, 17 years old. He has a 15-year-old girlfriend. They're sexting. It's, at least yeah. it's suspected. Uh, and now, to prove this crime, you know, child pornography laws being what they are, uh, the police want to take this 17-year-old to a hospital, give him an injection, Look at his erect wang okay, <laughs> and compare it using specialized software. I don't know where you get specialized wang comparing software, uh, but you know they want to use special software to look at his erect penis and then compare it to, uh, I guess, the evidence they've collected of sexting yeah. and then charge him with a crime. So the police are basically saying we should sexually assault this 17-year-old because that makes sense, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I like I've, I've read some of the comments on the story. I haven't found a single person who hmm. who uh, you know supports what the police are doing here. Right. Not even a not even a troll. Like <laughs> n- no one. No one. There's even. usually a troll. No. But I... There are so many. Th- there's so many. This is wrong on so many different levels. Yeah. I mean. Uh, uh, well, then, I you... mean, well, like like I, was, I mentioned a few weeks ago that you know in some places is. You know, if you take a, a nude photo of yourself as a child, mm-hmm. you can be charged with <sighs> possessing, ch- which is actually what happened in this case. Yeah, if you're yeah. in the wrong jurisdiction, like like here, yeah, you can basically, if you if you pose for your own camera and you're a little bit too risque about it and you're yeah. underage, you're a child pornographer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but like you said, so many comments out there, who thinks this is reasonable? Well, it boils down to the cops. Yeah. They well, are so disconnected from reality. It, it's like, I, yeah, anyway. Okay. We're running into uh, constriction of time, as we often do. Uh, we're going to be back after the music. We're going to talk to Bruce Fenton about all things Bitcoin, the Middle East, and liberty and freedom. It's going to be great. Right? Enjoying yourself, Andrew? Oh, I'm just uh, having so much of fun. All right. This is Ed <laughs> Yay, yay. It's a me, Mario, and my coins are losing so much of their value. Every day, the evil Bowser, he means some more and more coins. <laughs> Do you have any idea how hard it is to buy the Princess Peach? Her fancy gifts with coins that are worth a less and a less? But I say, to hell with the Bowser. I'm a buying the big coins. <laughs> Zombie what brains? Now from Global Edmonton. <laughs> This is CNN. This is CTV News. Brains.
ABC News. No! Friends. Friends. The Ed and Ethan Podcast. Come to where the brains are. All right, we're back. We return, and this time the computer will not eat what is coming up <laughs> like it did. What was that? Like a couple of weeks ago I did that, right? Yeah. Did you, I yeah. Think. You were here, Andrew, and, and everything that was you and I and uh, Tour de Meester just got, you know, it's, it was gone. It was, I, I kind of messed that up. I feel bad. <laughs> and it's not like losing an hour of, of, of actual work. Like, <laughs> you can always redo actual work, but you I, can't redo ah, something that's, that's, hmm, that's okay. bleeding and... Okay, no, I, I can I can buy that. All right, yeah. so as the music dies down, we are, of course, as I mentioned earlier in the show, we're going to talk to Bruce Fenton. He is a serial investor, entrepreneur, a guy of incredible wealth creation and value expression. How, how is that? Okay, uh, we're connected now, though. Bruce, you are, in fact, the founder of Atlantic Financial. You're active with several Bitcoin advocacy groups. You are a financial advisor to the likes of organizations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the program. So thanks for coming on today. Great to be back. Yeah, actually, we had you on our Bitcoin report when we had that live program going in California. That's and that right. was that was, I think, one of our best. Our, I well, you know, I'm I'm just gushing at this point, but yeah, it was it was a good interview. Let's leave it at that. The uh, so the reason I wanted to have you on today, well, because having a quality interview is always good. Um, but there's you're you're very much into Bitcoin. You're very much into what's happening in the Middle East because you uh, well, actually, you, you do a lot of work over there in, in respect to uh, uh, I guess economic development, right? Can you give me kind of a an, just kind of a high-level overview uh, why you're in the Middle East so often, because I know you travel there a lot. Sure. I just got back from three months over there. Uh, what my a, a division of my company, my company in Atlantic Financial is an investment firm, a wealth management company, and a division of that, uh, which I also run, called uh, Boston Gulf Advisors, focuses on bridging the gaps between the Middle East and, and mostly the U.S. And, and, and other Western countries. So if, if American groups want to do something there and you know navigate through if a, a Bitcoin company or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or a private equity firm or something like that wants to do something in the Middle East, we help them do that. And, uh, and so that's what I was, I was there for uh, on this trip. You know, that's why I'm, I'm there pretty often. You know, anything bridging that gap and uh, there's a lot of there's a big gap to be bridged in some in some ways sometimes. Sure. So what about when it comes to Bitcoin? You I guess because you're 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 trying to push this idea that uh, a lot of uh, firms over in the Middle East or really anywhere should probably pick up on the Bitcoin bandwagon, right? So have you? Well, maybe I shouldn't say you're pushing that a lot. I don't know. Uh, what is your kind of approach with Bitcoin and uh, larger financial concerns in the Middle East and uh, here in North America as well? Yeah, I'm doing it opportunistically whenever it's it's possible. I have a lot of connections there. I know a lot of people there, and the work that I've done in the past is it, it's not a natural fit for Bitcoin because Bitcoin didn't exist when I started. Doing it, but I do have a lot of contacts with sovereign wealth funds and uh, you know uh, government leadership and banks and large investors and that kind of thing. So, so certainly, since it's such an important part of my life, I I talk to it, I talk, talk to people about it, um, probably uh, more than they'd even want to hear. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of I'm kind of known as, as oh boy, here comes the Bitcoin guy again. <laughs> but it is interesting, and people are interested. So hopefully. Um, you know, if I talk their ear off for ninety minutes, at least uh, sixty minutes of it is interesting. <laughs> well, one would hope, right? So, <laughs> so Bruce, you're you're a financial advisor, and you you're into Bitcoin. That are there actually uh, funds or 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 investments out there that now carry and hold a portion of Bitcoin? No, not really. It's early yet. I think in general we're in the Middle East, probably a year year and a half behind the U.S., which of course has been a big a big year, uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago. Um, you, know, you know, when I first started getting into the community, I had people say, "We don't want, we don't want you, you suit wearing Wall Street guy." You know, <laughs> and uh, and now I'm considered the outlier at some of the, you know, if I get some of these conferences in New York, I'm I'm the I'm the crazy uh, the crazy crazy liberty lover. So so things have swung uh, quite a bit, and um, 
and that's where we're getting to in the in the Middle East. I'm sure that in a year uh, there will be a lot more things going on. There's there's different startups, and you know I, I'm definitely pushing very hard to, uh, to to do a lot of things over there. So it's it's a great market, a big big market for it. So when we're talking about uh, things that are going on in the Middle East, especially related to Bitcoin, I know that there's been some talk recently about ISIS. So before we get to that, though, uh, because you have kind of your finger on the pulse, if I can use a really cliched term, uh, on what's going on in the Middle East, uh, can you describe to the uninitiated what ISIS is? Give me an overview of where ISIS came from what they're doing in Iraq today, and we can kind of get into uh, why Bitcoin might be connected to that and what your thoughts are on that. Sure. It, it'd probably be uh, too hard to, to really cover in with any justice because mm. it is so complex. And, and anything I say, it's, you know, I've got to qualify with 10 other statements. Otherwise, people are going to say, oh, you know, oh, that's not accurate or whatever. It's, it's just too too hard to kind of uh, put in, in, in really simple terms. But in, in basic terms, we went in and broke everything and messed everything up, and and that created all kinds of problems. And once again, like we have had so many times in history in uh, Libya and Afghanistan and Latin America and other places, we've you know given guns to uh, people uh, trying to overthrow bad guys, and now they become bad guys. It happened with the Mujahideen. It happened with. ISIS now, it, it, you know, we we were giving. Remember, remember how we were hailing the the, the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan. Oh. These are the greatest guys in the world. We're going to mm. give them guns. You don't hear that anymore. Uh, why? Because those guns we gave them are being used to kill us. Uh, so it's it's a big mess. And basically, the uh, ISIS has arisen from this complete and total dysfunctional and now very statist system that we went in and imposed. You know, we, we went in to bomb people into quote-unquote democracy, and what did we do? We, we went, and the first thing we did is banned political parties. The next thing we did is banned newspapers. The next thing we did is take groups that were not previously separated by religion, and we separated by religion and said, okay, Shia over here, Sunni over here. These are things that we did. This is a matter of historical record when the Coalition Provisional Authority went into Iraq and uh, shut off all of the government services, closed all the ministries, uh, uh, laid off a million uh, guys from the military, um, giving them nothing to do <laughs> but go home with their guns. I mean, just preposterous and total, complete incompetence. So it's no surprise that you have an organization like ISIS, which uh, you know has has come about, which is basically a giant gang. It's like MS-13 or the Crips or Bloods, only worse and very violent and mm. causing all kinds of issues. Um, so that that's basically where we're at. And then there was this piece that, <laughs> that somebody claimed was from ISIS saying that they embrace Bitcoin, which you may have you may have seen that may have been what you were mm. about to ask about, which I yeah. think was was really uh, you know really nonsense. I mean, uh, um, you know anybody who's read any of these things that actually come from these sources would would know there was there, there was all kinds of problems with it. it was very uh, silly. I'm amazed that anybody, especially mainstream news, took it seriously. Well, I, I don't know. It's nice to have kind of a whipping boy every so often to uh, to to show off to the masses, right? And 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 sometimes Bitcoin seems to serve as that. What was what was the the connection being made was that what ISIS was trying to use Bitcoin as some sort of a, a way to to transfer wealth to ISIS, right? Like that was kind of the premise, or well, it was a paper that came out on Google Docs which said. Uh, you know, dear uh, you know, brothers in our struggle, uh, I just want to tell you how great Bitcoin is, Purpo purportedly from a from a member of ISIS. Mm -hmm. So supposedly a terrorist went out and said, oh, uh, my brothers in the terrorist movement, I want to tell you about this great new tool called Bitcoin. And they even mentioned Darkcoin mm -hmm. and how great it is to have us do our horrible terrorism activities. And the reason that that seems preposterous is, one, how likely does it seem that a terrorist would decide to use Google Docs as his preferred platform for disseminating information to other terrorists? Another one is, would they really write a paper on Bitcoin? Another is, having been in, in the region, would they really know about something like Darkcoin? I mean, most people in the even in the U.S. and Europe who are much more active in, in the Bitcoin space 
don't know about these finer points uh, that were mentioned in the paper, especially things like dark coin, which is more like, you know, something you're going to hear about at the, you know, Canadian Bitcoin conference or something like that. It's not, it's not something that people would, would know about there. Um, Then they had like, uh, they had footnotes for, for common terms from, uh, from the Quran and, you know, kind of religious struggle type of terms. Why would they footnote a term like jihad, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if they were talking to people in their own movement? And then they used things that are, I've, I've looked at a lot of anti-Muslim hate sites and, uh, um, uh, you know, blogs and things which are designed to try and create um, anger and, and fear and misconceptions. And a lot of the wording um was similar to that in in the, you know these terms used to describe um, you know uh, non-Muslims and things like that. It, a lot of it was it was it was it looked like it was it looked like somebody who had a tiny bit of of knowledge taken from uh, you know, hate sites and used that to try and make it believable, hmm. and then they and then they put it out. So uh, the odds of that being real are, in my opinion. No. Well, uh, if but, if you don't think they came from the um, actually came from ISIS or the group over there, who do you think uh, would actually be motivated any, to do something like that? Any suspects? <laughs> you, you, you never want to underestimate how dumb uh, government can be, but but in this in this case, I I can't imagine even government would be dumb enough to make something so silly. I mean, it's just so mm. it's so ridiculous. I mean, it is it is possible. I mean, you know, I, I but I don't think that it was some kind of grand government conspiracy. I think it was just somebody playing a hoax, having some fun. You know, yeah. there's some guys on the. Um, you know the the kind of anti Bitcoin Reddit sub that that go out and you know they come up with some pretty clever things actually they they uh, you know there was there was one that fooled a number of people they came out with a um, a post claiming to be from an IT guy who who works at Goldman Sachs who said wow I found this this uh, PowerPoint on one of the the <laughs> laptops I was working on and people actually fell for it for a little bit and 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 it was it was. Uh, I mean, it was really obviously fake, um, and and then they admitted they basically admitted it was a hoax, um, uh, you know, pretty quickly. There, there was there was you know keys in there that that kind of proved it was a hoax. So I, I think it was probably right. along those lines. I think it was probably just my best guess would be just an individual, and and maybe not even necessarily with with real you know horrible motives like they want to destroy Bitcoin. I think they were more like they want to make Bitcoin look silly. Um, w- but, would be my best guess. You know, like in my my sense is you would expect there to be people who are passionately involved in Bitcoin who, who are supporters. And then on the other side, you'd have people who are completely indifferent. But I, I have a hard time understanding how someone could be passionately uh, opposed hmm. to to Bitcoin. But is that is that what you think is happening? There are a few people who are just, for whatever reason, have a hate on? <laughs> well, there's, I mean, there's whole sub uh, subreddits where people spend their their valuable time in their day instead of hanging out with their family or watching a movie or going to the gym they spend their time hating bitcoin why so, why, why, yeah, why I mean, would they, if, if they think it's uh, so terrible why don't they just ignore it that's <laughs> what, what i think if they think if they think it's going nowhere and it's it's a it's a complete waste of time they're trying to save you wasting? from yourself andrew is that yeah. what you think it is what, once people hate something enough, it becomes consuming, and that's why what we have with political parties. We have. I I, I played a joke one time. I took my, my name and I mixed up the letters, and uh, um, I, or I, I used my middle name and I I think I spelled my na- my last name backwards and said I was Charles Not and uh, or, or no, I didn't say it was me. I said there's a candidate named Charles Not Neff. Um, <laughs> And I put all the real positions I have. And on uh, one group, I told them it was a you know, diehard Republican. Another group, I said, this is a diehard Democrat. Mm. And, and people really believe that. They say, yeah, this guy's my guy. You know, all based on, not, not, you know, same opinions I have. The people who hate me, if I say I'm a libertarian, they love me if I say that I'm a Republican or love me if, if I say I'm a Democrat, depending oh. on which group I'm talking to. That's hmm. horrible. <laughs> I oh, I, I guarantee you, you could do exactly the same experiment. I guarantee you, you could take Rand Paul's positions on every single issue and change his name and say he's a Democrat and go to people in Berkeley or Cambridge and say, here is this Democrat who believes in immigration and freedom and wants to get rid of the Federal Reserve. Do you do you support this Democrat? And people would love it. They would love Rand Paul. Yeah. Um if, if, but 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 you put that R next to his name, and there's a lot of people who who hate him because they think he's in the same party as John McCain, and you, you couldn't have 
two more different people. Uh, so, so yeah, people people will hate just just because uh, of 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 what it is. So once somebody goes down that rabbit hole of really identifying themselves as a hardcore uh, you know, Republican who hates liberals or a hardcore you know, Democrat who you know hates conservatives, uh, it's just like the people who hate Bitcoin. They they uh, they become so consumed by it that logic won't uh, change it. And these people are going to be you know very sad when when this thing uh, continues to do well. And um, you know they'll 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 be in an increasing minority. It'll be kind of like hating the internet. I mean, there was a lot of people who hated the internet. You know, there's mm. people who said the World Wide Web was evil and would do nothing but spread child pornography and waste <laughs> people's brains and um, all these other things. And also, you know, the local mall down the road does more sales than the entire internet, so it's right. useless. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we've heard all of that kind of stuff before. I guess, you know, it's interesting that you, you characterize it this way and you talk about the identity politics that are Republicans and Democrats, R's and D's and others, right? And and it's, it's interesting, I had really thought of this because I connect uh, Bitcoin with with my uh, anarcho-capitalist sort of uh, perspective deeply, right? I, I love Bitcoin because it is so uh, corporate buzzword coming synergistic <laughs> with my with my own personal perspective of, of what I believe a moral uh, sort of uh, uh, structure and framework for the world world is. So. Uh, but maybe that's a terrible thing uh, because you're talking about identity politics and and how people tribalize and kind of make things into us and them, right? So this yes. is an us issue, and the, uh, anybody with a different opinion is a them, and we don't listen to them because they're not us. It, it's a very sort of disturbing uh, characteristic of of contemporary society, and I I, I guess I don't know, Bruce. For for those of us out there who really do see Bitcoin as a kind of a liberating device, a tool to be used for uh, achieving greater personal liberty, do you think maybe that's a, a something that that's potentially very dangerous? Is is buying into the us and them? Yes, it's dangerous for us and it's dangerous for them. <laughs> um, it, and it's it's funny that that I, you know that's the first thing that comes to mind. I mean, we we really are kind of us in this community, and and there there are many of quote unquote us who think the same about politics and other things in addition to Bitcoin. And then there there is sort of this this them thing, and and a lot of a lot of sort of us in the community have been talking about ways, and I've talked to to other people about ways to try and reach. Other people, and and I've had conversations with some of the great, uh, you know, speakers and and uh, people in this movement when we've been speakers at events, and we've said, hey, we, we don't want to alienate people just because we're libertarians or we're believers in small government. We have to recognize that you know one percent of America voted for Gary Johnson, and in other countries, it's probably there's even less of a libertarian bent. Um, in some countries, like in the Middle East, where I, where I go. Uh, it it there's there is no libertarian party. Um, you, mm. you know, you're really turning off maybe 99 percent at best if you go into it too hardcore. So I don't want to turn anybody off. I want to talk about it from a technological angle and talk about it from the great benefits. But the 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 challenge of that, as hard as it is for me to uh, kind of keep quiet if I'm talking, especially to a new person about Bitcoin about these kind of big picture issues sometimes they'll bring it up uh they'll say hey well what what about government isn't i i just just the other day i was trying as hard as i could to talk to a newcomer about bitcoin about how great it is and i i stayed away from politics i talked about all of the good and positive things from a pure technical angle about what it does and then he brought up the question yeah but won't this hurt government and isn't that <laughs> bad now how how do i answer that you know uh he brought it up so so it is interesting i think that we we do want to make an effort to be very inclusive and get other people on board and not scare people and not not I mean you're not going to get somebody who um, has been a lifelong Republican or Democrat to all of a sudden become a Murray Rothbard fan because you tell them about this new crazy geek money. Um, <laughs> you 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 got to you got to go to, and take baby steps and maybe let you know just let them think about it on their own and and some of them never will. Uh, come down that path of non-aggression, so it is a it is a trick, and it's something that I I struggle with every day. I, I want to reach as many people as possible, and uh, I don't want to turn anybody off. Hmm. So that's a for see my perspective is is typically very deontological, right? So I, I get this kind of a that's where I get the kind of button pusher quality every so often is is that I just like to 
kind of agitate people and make them have a think. But, you know, that's not always well advised. And I'm, <clears throat> I guess now you're, you're just kind of inspiring me to think about uh, how you connect with people on the Bitcoin issue. I mean, if somebody does say, look, yeah, isn't this possible it can hurt government? I mean, my natural inclination is to say, yeah, <laughs> boy, right. can it ever. But maybe you do want to be a little bit uh, more inclusive and, and explain, you know, look, uh, markets can be regulated by government. They will attempt to uh, to try to bring this into a, uh, a rather common fold and, and, and chucks. I mean, uh, there are different ways to approach this, just like a gold or silver market. But let's not talk about the Crimex. I, you know, I, I guess it, it's very difficult to reconcile, but it's it's an interesting sort of discussion that people are having. And you point out there are a lot of people around the world that have not even given a second thought to this notion that uh, maybe uh, a path of non-aggression and then this this sort of uh, divestment from government control is maybe even a good thing. So, yeah, right. I can agree with that. I and I do I do it. sometimes try and make people think. I mean, not, all, not I, I hopefully always try and make people think, but I do sometimes without trying to beat people over the head with my own beliefs, I try and ask questions or make subtle statements that make people challenge their own um, perception during the election when, when um, you know, a bunch of people were really in favor of Romney and a bunch of people were really in favor of Obama. And uh, people would ask me, well, who are you voting for? I would very, very simply, I'd say, well, well, I'm not voting for either because I'm anti-war. Mm. And that really hit, mm. especially Obama supporters. They say, oh, my God, well, I'm anti-war, too. I say, but you need to vote that way. You're not really anti-war if you don't vote that way. He's pro-war. Mm. I'm anti-war. And, they, and you could see this kind of wheels in their head. So, you know, they're challenging their own belief because probably 90 percent of Obama supporters consider themselves anti-war. And some of them are really diehard, uh, you know, hippie 60s <laughs> Democrats who, who – you know, are, are self-identify themselves as really peaceful people, but they're not acting that way. So I would challenge it, and that and that's a statement that I think uh, is is very simple, but also very um, impactful. And the same thing with with Bitcoin. When people say things like this, this fellow I was just mentioning, he said, "Well, isn't that bad for government and their ability to collect taxes to do things?" And I very simply, I just said, he said, he said, he said, Bruce, government does a lot of good things. And I, rather than say, eh, I don't know about that, which is what I was <laughs> thinking, I said, I said, I said, okay, that may be true, but shouldn't those things be voluntary for people to support or not support? I said, I, I just believe that they should be voluntary. That's it. And I always say that about government when people say things like, uh, uh, I mean, even in the Middle East with things like dress code and th some of these things, I, I always say, I have no problem with suggestions. If somebody wants to make a suggestion, I'm cool with that. If they want to suggest anything from, from, from dress code to who you marry to how you work ship cool I'm, I'm fine with that um it's when they want to use violence against you uh that i'm not cool with that right you know um we we just got a few minutes left here before we we end off the show here at dailypaulradio.com but I'm, I'm wondering you mind sticking around for an after show because I'd, I'd like to talk to you a bit more about kind of the background of how you how you came to where you are in your belief set and uh, you, your perspective sure. of the world. So that's cool. Is that yeah? All right. Yeah, be glad to. So we'll we'll do that. But before before we do, we, like I said, we got a few minutes left. So um, when when you're let's let's just draw back to Bitcoin for a moment and the Middle East. So you're 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 involved with big organizations. Obviously, in the United States, we've seen uh, some big adoption moves: Overstock.com, Tiger Direct, uh, uh, Dish Network, uh, some others. You know, all, uh, accepting Bitcoin. So there is some massive spread. Uh, have you been able to use this as sort of I'm going to say ammo uh, in 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 other regions of the world where you say, look, developing market is exploding, get on board. Have you seen a reaction specifically to that sort of uh, reality? Yeah, there was uh, some services that I bought when I was in the Middle East. I don't want to say what it was because I don't want to give it the company away. But but I bought some stuff that was it was fairly expensive. It was about fifty thousand dollars or so. And I knew the people who were kind of the the bosses of that, you know, kind of the parent company. And I went to the CFO and I said, hey, blah, 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 Bitcoin. I said, you know, by the way, I owe your subsidiary this money. Do you think you'd take Bitcoin for it? <laughs> and I didn't I thought there's no way this guy's gonna say and he, he almost said yes. He actually thought about it and considered it. He said, Well, we're thinking about it. He asked a couple questions and he did come back and say, Ah, oh, we're not quite ready yet. But I couldn't I mean it was just a throwaway. It's kinda like when you're in your taxi or you know, a lot of us Bitcoiners, they we ask everybody, Hey, will you take it? <laughs> I didn't think I mean, if they took it, it would have been, you know, huge uh 
if if they allowed you to even say that they took it, it would have been huge news. You know, big, big, big uh, company, and uh, and so so the fact that that was that was there, I would see. You know, I'm going to go back to this guy next time I buy services from the subsidiary. I'm going to ask again, and. Um, and maybe they will take it, and and if not them, somebody like them will for from me or somebody else. Whether it's big services like this or or you know much lower ticket items. So so yeah, I think I mean they, they they're big consumers of news in the Middle East. Uh, Saudi Arabia is number one in the world per capita with YouTube views, um, and so I know uh, you know you can track like my own videos on YouTube where I talk about Bitcoin, I can see where people have watched them. YouTube provides those stats. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, thousands of people have seen this stuff in Saudi Arabia. Um, And I I, I would love to know how it is for, you know, Roger Veer or Andreas or somebody else like that who has even more views. Maybe a a good number of people are watching uh, stuff in the region because... It's me, and I'm. Fr- I work there, but but I would bet you, I, I guarantee you that Andreas and Roger and Eric Voorhees and other people probably have had a lot of people uh, view their stuff right. from and, their and, region as well. And here I am, just asking local restaurants, "Hey, you accept Bitcoin?" But you know, getting that reaction. Um, we're going to be uh, right into the after show, right after music here. So thank you very much for listening on DailyPaulRadio.com. Check us out at EdandEthan.com, and as always, feedback at EdandEthan.com will get our ear. This is Ed and Ethan.